Good evening. Welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ Wednesday night class. I'm Josh Nancy, and I'll be filling in for Baxter for the next three weeks while he's in Washington visiting his sister. I like to let you all know what he's up to while he's gone and I'm filling in, so I stole some of his pictures off of Facebook to show you all. First of all, this is a picture from the Wyoming-Montana border that he took on Monday. I took a guess without asking him at where exactly he was based on the path he said he was taking, and I think he's somewhere around Aberdeen. We'll see when he gets a chance to watch this video if that's where he actually was. We also see him in this shot enjoying himself drinking some coffee on Tuesday morning, so looks like he's off to a great start, and I'm sure at this point he's ready to be done driving if he's not already done driving. While he's gone, I thought it would be good if we picked up where we left off in our Sunday morning class since we were only able to get into the first few chapters of Hebrews, and I was really excited on digging in there. If you do still happen to have your book from class, we'll be on Lesson 4, but more importantly, we'll be in Hebrews Chapter 4 if you want to be opening your Bibles there. Since it's been a while, I think almost over six months, let's do a quick review of what we covered in the first three chapters of the book. In Chapter 1, we covered the deity of Jesus, we talked about how Jesus is better than the angels and how he is the creator of the world. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus comes to our aid when we are tempted. He's superior to Moses and the Levitical priesthood. And finally, the heavenly sanctuary is superior to the Mosaic tabernacle. All of this is to start off the book to help the Jews who had a hard time understanding why they should move over to Christianity by appealing to what they knew from the Old Testament and their upbringing. Ultimately, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for the reasons called out in chapter 1. In chapter 2, we covered the power of Christ and why we should listen to the words he's spoken to us. We also took a look at why we needed Jesus to come to earth and suffer and die for us. He needed to be that perfect sacrifice. The suffering Jesus faced allows him to be a compassionate high priest who understands what we've gone through and helps to intercede for us. In chapter 3, we honed in more on how Jesus was superior to Moses. Moses was held in high esteem by the Jews, so it was important to make this comparison so they could understand they need to follow Jesus now. In the back half of chapter 3, we learned how it's important to remain faithful and not to be overtaken or have our hearts hardened by sin. We have this great high priest and leader who is better than what came before, so we should follow him. Now that we've all gotten a quick recap of the first three chapters of Hebrews, I'm sure we all feel like experts there, and we'll move on to chapter four. If, however, you're interested in learning more about the first three chapters of Hebrews, feel free to go back and reread those chapters as they'll help you in the classes in the coming weeks. And you can also go back and watch our previous class videos from back when we were meeting in person. Tonight, we'll be talking about rest in chapter four. Rest is important in our lives, it helps us to be focused. It's a time when our body heals and repairs itself. If we're able to achieve solid rest, it's also something we tend to look forward to. There are quite a few long days where all I can think about is laying down and going to sleep at night or taking a nap in the middle of the day. It can be a great motivator to get through the day to think about that time of peaceful rest. As we start our study tonight, let's think about how important that physical rest is in our lives and let's apply that same mentality to spiritual rest. As we get started with chapter 4 tonight, it'll be important to understand what spiritual rest is and why we need it. So there were a couple passages of scripture that came to mind that I wanted to look at with you all before we get started. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, the Bible says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so in Matthew, we see that we can, uh, you know, it's okay if we're tired and we're heavy laden, and we will be if we're doing the work that we should, but that God will ultimately give us rest if we take his yoke and we do what he says. And then in 2 Thessalonians, Chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, we see, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, 
and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. The Bible talks about rest so much because this is our ultimate goal. Our lifelong dream isn't to always be working or involved in the strife of the world that we have to deal with every day, but to have everlasting rest in heaven with God. That's our ultimate goal as Christians. In keeping with the themes of Hebrews, let's take a closer look in chapter 4 at why our promised rest as Christians is better than the rest promised to the Israelites in the wilderness. Chapter 4 starts with the word therefore, which means we'll need to back up and read some context from chapter 3 to understand what's going on here. So let's start by reading Hebrews chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom he was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of disbelief. So as we're reading through chapter 4 in these first couple of verses, let's remember who we just read about that lost heart and what they did, and ultimately how they weren't able to enter the land of promise because of their unbelief. So now we'll turn over to chapter 4 and read verses 1 through 5. Therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. So let's break down this chunk of scripture. I think the first thing for us to consider is what the Israelites were striving for. They wanted to reach the promised land. They'd been in an Egyptian rule for many years at this point. They were looking forward to the land of Canaan. This land that flowed with milk and honey was their reward if they'd done what they were supposed to. Many of the Israelites fell short of this prize, and the same can happen to us today. This is what the writer of, of Hebrews is conveying in verse 1. Our consequence of disobedience is ultimately not spending eternity in heaven with God. We don't want to come short of our promise in any way, whether it means we came around too late, or we never cared enough at all. In verse 2, we learn that we've heard the message that we need to hear. The good tidings, or the good news that we've been studying about in Luke on previous Wednesday night classes, is something that I think we've probably all heard about, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. This sacrifice that he made is what allows us to be in heaven. There's no need to wait around and say we're waiting for something else for us to act. We have that perfect sacrifice now, so there's nothing that keeps us from acting. And it is not enough to hear the word. We must also believe it, as we see. John 3.36 tells us this very clearly. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So it is important for us and those around us to make sure we are being obedient to the word and not just hearers of it. Those who have an active faith are the ones who will achieve that eternal rest with God one day. We first see this type of rest in Genesis when God rests on the Sabbath day. This is also the same kind of rest that God promised the Israelites as they were led through the wilderness. We need to take heart and look forward to this rest just as the Israelites did. We can have things that distract us from the goal, just like 10 of the spies were filled with fear. It's easy for us to take a current to take a look at the current situation we're in and say there's no way we can handle it. Right now, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and it can be really difficult to spread God's word as we might have before, and also difficult to stay positive on ourselves. 
So we need to make sure we're thinking about how do we make sure we're not like the 10 spies, but realize that with God on our side, we can do anything. Once we have that mindset and learn how to make sure it continues, then we can truly be faithful and obedient to God. And as we're thinking through that, we can think about ways that we can reach out and we can support each other's brothers and sisters in Christ, but also be good examples to those around us and check on our friends and families to encourage them and spread the gospel to them through other means than we might typically do. Now, let's take a look really quick at um, what David wrote in Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in Mirabah, as in the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, through the, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation, and said that they are a people who err in their heart, and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, truly, they shall not enter into my rest. David reminds the people when he writes this passage as well that God was angry with the people for testing him. Sometimes I like to think to myself, how would this passage be written today? <laughs> would I want it to be written to me or to us as a church? So let's think about that. Would we want this passage to say, do not harden your hearts as you did in Madison during the pandemic. Those of the Four Lakes Church tried me, though they had seen what I did. They shall never enter my rest. I don't think that's what we would want to be written here and want to be called out for. So let's keep that in mind when those challenging times come up and we lose sight of our goal that we can do anything that we need to because we have God on our side. So let's move on to the next couple of verses in this passage to learn more about how to achieve rest. We'll pick up in uh, verses 6 through 13 of Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of their disobedience, he again fixes a certain day, today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as he has said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, for if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest was, has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We see another call out in verse 6 that the Israelites weren't able to enter the promised land because of their disobedience. Why does the writer call this out again? I think it's because it's partially because he wants to get that point across to readers that this can happen to some of you. You will miss out on your eternal rest because of your disobedience. And so it's important for us to take note of that too when things are repeated in the Bible and especially that close together, that it's also something that can trip us up. It wasn't enough for the people to show their faith by leaving Egypt. They had to continue it in the wilderness when they faced more challenges. The same is true for us today. It isn't enough for us to be baptized and put on Christ. We must continue to earnestly follow after God. The Hebrew writer also quotes David from the book of Psalms here to show that this continued to happen to the Israelites and that there is further rest to come for us, in, which is in heaven. The Hebrew writer, including us, haven't missed out on our true chance at on our chance at true rest. So it wasn't something that was just coming by the people going to the land of Canaan. It is something that if we follow God's word, we can achieve today as well. Now, as we remember back on what the Israelites, on the Israelites, we do know that there were some who were faithful and allowed to enter the promised land. Joshua led those people, and they were able to enter the land of Canaan. After the tribes had finished clearing out the land, they were given rest. 
I'll read from Joshua chapter 22, verse 4. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he promised them. Therefore turn and go to your tents in the land where your possessions lie, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. An important lesson we see here is that when God's followers do what he is asked, they receive what they are promised. However, we learn this is not the ultimate rest we're talking about in Hebrews chapter 4 that they receive. We have yet to reach the Sabbath rest that is talked about in verse 9. This is the ultimate rest with God that we have to face trials and tribulations to reach. Acts chapter 14 verse 22 says, Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And I wanted to call this out because, as we all know as Christians, we are going to face various temptations, trials, and tribulations in our lives. And it's important for us to keep sight of that rest in heaven that we want with God so that we can make it through those and stay motivated. I wanted to also look at the the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, or Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 25 because it sheds a little bit of light on what that'll look like for us after we pass on from this life. So picking up in verse 19, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with crumbs that which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died, and was carried away by angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus' bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. If we are like Lazarus, we will be provided with with comfort for our troubles. If we were like the rich man, we will be in torment. I think that's important for us to keep in mind as we look around in the world today and we may see other people who aren't doing the right things being rewarded for it now. The tables will be turned if we do what we're supposed to, but we have to stay strong and not just do that in one instance, but throughout our entire lives. Now that we know it's important to achieve this eternal rest, how do we get to it? We must be obedient as we've discussed. But that isn't just going to happen without any effort. Heaven is a place for the diligent. Chapter 3 and verse 7 of chapter 4 emphasize the importance of taking care of things we need to today. We must be diligent starting today because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. So what does diligence look like for us today? First, we need to spend time talking to God through prayer and letting us talk to him through his word. A verse that I like to keep in my mind is also James chapter 1, verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. We are to do what it takes to stay faithful and spend time helping those in need. These can be orphans and widows as mentioned here, or many others during the trying times we have going on in the world right now. This can be checking in on brothers and sisters in Christ, or maybe some friends or family. It's important that each of us are doing our part to help others in order to serve God to the best of our ability. In verses 12 and 13, we see the omniscience of God. His word exposes our inner being, and he knows everything about us. He'll know the motivation behind why we do what we do, and if we're really doing the best that we can. That can be a scary thought at face value. But the reality of it is, he's provided everything we need to know to make him happy in his word that he's given to us. If we read it and know it, we know what's right and wrong. We can judge our own intentions and discern our own thoughts. It's comforting to know that even if we mess up, 
God knows when we're trying because he knows our heart. It's also important to note here that God's word is living and active. It is ongoing, and it wasn't something that was written thousands of years ago that no longer applies to us because our situation has changed or something like that. It has the same effect on people today as it did back then. If they hear it, it compels them to act and change their lives. So let's be thankful that God is all-knowing and provides us with his word. The fact that God is all-knowing also means God knows what we need and what our troubles are. He shows us this in what we'll look at in verses 14 through 16 by giving us Jesus as a high priest who knows what we've been through. So let's read the last couple verses of this passage, um, verses 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Next week, we'll be focusing more specifically on Jesus as our high priest, but I wanted to hit some quick highlights so we can be thinking about it in preparation. The first thing that we notice here is consistent throughout the book of Hebrews, and it's that Jesus is divine and passed through the heavens. And this is an important reminder both to us and to the people reading this book that it was written um, to directly in this time as well, because um, a lot of times people will say that Jesus is a great teacher, but he's not you know, divine and there's nothing, he's still just a man. And that's simply not true. We know that he passed through the heavens and we know he you know, played a huge role in creating the earth and all the things we read about in previous chapters. And so it's important for us to realize that because it's ultimately what makes him able to be the perfect sacrifice. So our confession can hold true that Jesus is the son of God. We also learn that he's been tempted as we are, so he understands our temptations and failures. The goal of him coming wasn't to say, see, I did it perfectly, why can't you? But rather to be able to give us the confidence to still come before his throne, even when we do make mistakes. This is important for us to keep in mind because we do know that we'll have that um, intercessor for us with God that can you know, kind of convey how it feels to be a human. But I think we can also take an important lesson from this as we think about how do we treat other people as Christians? Do we look at them and say, well, I've never struggled with that sin, so why do you? I've never committed that specific sin, so why did you do that? I think a lot of times it's easy for us in the church to fall under that trap. But we need to be like Jesus and know that we've experienced temptations and trials and try to help those people instead of judging them and not being helpful and loving. We finish this passage out by being told we can be confident coming to God and asking for mercy and grace when we need it. This is also important as we are instructed in the Bible to be bold when we come before the throne of God, but that might be hard if we feel like we've sinned and we've messed up and that we can't be, but that's where Jesus comes in. He's dealt with what we've had to deal with. He's had those struggles, and he really understands what it's like to go through those trials and tribulations. And so we have him um, standing in for us so that we can be confident and know that God wants us to talk to him and pray to him and come before him. So it's important for us to keep that in mind as we go throughout our lives, um, especially in these trying times, that we can confidently go and talk to God about our problems and what we need help with. So next week, we'll dive more into the differences between Jesus as a high priest and some of the other high priests in the past. And I think it would be good by next week if you all want to go back and read chapters 1, 2, and 3, just as a recap, and then uh, go ahead and read through chapter 5 as well. And if you have any questions before class that you want me to answer, feel free to just um, text me or email me, and I'll, I can answer them on class as well. But at this point, let's close together with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and the ability to study your word together, even if it's different than what we're used to. Help us to look for ways to encourage each other 
and to always be focused on you no matter what's going on in our lives. We know that there's a lot of people who have become sick because of the pandemic or have um, normal illnesses going on that are amplified because of the pandemic. Please be with all of them, those of our congregation who are struggling with illnesses and those around the world and our friends and family. Help us to be mindful and please be with those people who are lonely right now, who haven't been able to get out much. It's really hard to be isolated in these trying times. Please be with them and comfort them. Help our leaders around the nation, the state, and locally to make the right decisions so that your people are taken care of and help those around the world to continue to serve you and to keep heart as they do your good work. We thank you for everything that you've given us and help us to stay encouraged through the rest of this week and to focus on you as we come back together on Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen.